Everybody, I'm Jeff Fuller from Fuller and Burger Works. We have Matthew Enderley from Patchface and DJ Anderson from, from Digitizing Masterclass. And today is May 16th. It took me a while to look at my calendar of 2023. And we will be talking about patches. Matt's got one that we're actually going to go through um, and make. But let's jump through the comments here. We have Mark Basalda joining us from South Dakota. Doesn't say that, I just know. <laughs> we have Marble Fawn joining us from North Central Minnesota. Brandy joining us from Colorado. And Simon Windmill from Iowa, USA. So I am in Iowa too. And yep, not South Dakota anymore. South Dakota. So Matt, give him your secrets. Okay, well, the first secret is that you're going to be going to prison after I tell you this, which is <laughs> not not doing that you have to go to your local war thunders uh forum for that for all those top secrets there we don't do that here we just okay. get uh, trade secrets because those don't exist um oh now frank commented hi frank yes we we'll yes. wait for jeff to click frank it Frank joining us in the uk there you go um okay well very unstructured little thing we're doing here um basically if you don't know me as you can already see right uh here it says patch phrase that means all i do is patches so hopefully you'll learn something if you missed our last live uh, from last week it was really entertaining unless you were me uh because well, it was fantastically entertaining for everyone but matt yes we had both jeff justin and mike teaming up against me and uh uh, it was yeah, like but, Mystery Science Theater 3000, yeah. and we were the guys sitting in the front rows making fun of the movie while it was playing. It was so great. Yeah. Well, at least the project got done, so uh, we had a lot of good things about that live, so we're doing another project. And uh, so today, we're going to be doing a custom patch, which just happened to be a military patch, because why wouldn't it be? Um, but we saw someone in... Uh, one of the, the groups saying how they have a patch that they need, uh, but they don't have their computer to digitize it. So we figured, you know, why not? We'll do a, a live on actually digitizing it and uh, sew it out and see how it turns out. However, cheated and already digitized it because I'm not doing that live for as much as they already, uh, you know, heckled me. So uh, <laughs> No, but no, we want to see you do it live, Matt. Uh, well, we're not going to do that. Um, and I apologize, the screen looks a little blurry. I should have probably not put it on my white screen, but uh, we'll blame Jeff for that. And, you know, we'll go with Justin because he's not here. Right. Everything today is Justin's fault. Yeah. And it's not DJ's fault. <laughs> um, all right. So I'm going to click this tab, and that's the patch we're going to do. Um, now, someone else right now in the comments is like, hey, I know that one probably. He's probably typing that. Um, and we'll give him the file for this because he doesn't have his computer nearby. He just moved back to the States. So you can pretty much guess exactly who this is. Uh, but yeah, we're going to go ahead, flip camera around, go over to my machine, and we're going to set it up to run the patch. We're going to talk about the different materials that we're using. Uh, it's really only two materials. Uh, so it makes it super easy. It's four. Okay. <laughs> 
Well, then we might as well include air because you got to breathe for the operator. And <laughs> water. You got thread, upper thread, bobbin thread. Yeah, but you can't embroider without upper thread and, bo and bobbins. That's not embroidery. That's just not embroidery. <laughs> okay. But yeah, so we're going to go ahead. We're going to send this to the machine and look. Here we go. Just like I predicted the future, like the Simpsons episodes. We well, it is like eight second lag or nine second lag from when we say something to they hear it. And then they have to respond. Exactly. And then I have to read it and then click it. So uh, I think enough of this uh, jabbering on. We should probably spin over to the other doodad. The other doodad? Yeah, the other oh. doodad. What else? I don't know what to call it. It's just a big, awesome green machine. Oh, <laughs> it's not blue? Uh, Well, we're not using the happy right now. We're using the Tajima because it's a, a Oh, yeah, your happies are blue. I forgot. I was being a smart aleck. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they both make green, so. Well, there is that. But, okay, I got to disconnect, run away, and then leave the stream awkwardly to the these two individuals. Okay. You could patch. Okay, bye. Nice knowing you guys. Uh-huh. Completely awkward. <laughs> to say the least. Yep. So while he's not paying attention, we'll go and tell you all the secrets he's about to reveal so that you've already heard them once, at least until he comes back on, and then we'll stop talking. So number one, he's going to be using um, Filtech Thread through Habendash because they have uh, THIO certified thread colors. That's the Institute of Heraldry for the military. So they're military certified colors. Um, if I remember right, the thread is very compliant too, which if you guys aren't aware, that means that it's made in the U.S. from U.S. materials, um, which can kind of be important for things uh, that you make with the military. Um, and then, I don't know, Matt, you're using, oh, see, he's even got his own like sticker branded thread chart. Yeah, if you watched the last slide, I talked about why it's branded to mine, but they added a section in here, and let me get it to focus, where it says it's approved by the Institute of Heraldry. So if it has the little square, it means that it's one of the colors. So like linen is the color that you would use for white and stuff like that. It doesn't tell you what color it lines up with, but they have a link on the very bottom of their website and it's just what it's what patch phrase recommends because it's what patch phrase uses <laughs> just throwing that out there and right. uh i have samples of what i just did recently there's a big cut up because i needed to patch and i did not take this out before so now the camera's in the way i'm really intrigued on how you got your sash to mount into those hoop arms oh yeah you just kind of slap it in there with magnets and duct tape but, but yeah, so these are a sash frame. Okay, well, you know, maybe I unzoom it. There we go. Hey, it focused. You can get a ton of patches in a sash frame. Awesome. It's a must in my book just because of the amount I do. But you can see how it, it's super nice because, I mean, if you think of this as $12 for this patch, $12 for that one, yeah, it's you add up pretty quick and you don't have to deal with garments. So it's just twill and stabilizer. As you can maybe see right here, it's just one piece of twill and one piece of stabilizer. And one mat. You always need that operator. Yes, you always need someone capable of pushing the green button. But what happens if your thread breaks? Well, that's then that'll be next week's live when Jeff tells you about how to rethread your machine with the proper knot. Oh yeah. That's pretty fun. That was one of the best things I learned how to tie two cones of thread together and pull it through. So if you don't know, uh, I already said that there's only two layers of material that I'm using. So the stabilizer, your foundation, um, this specifically is Gunolds 2085. That's primarily what I use. It's a cutaway. It's a 2.5 ounce, and I use one layer of that. Wait, What's Matt. Wait, wait, wait. What? Brandy asks, what is your favorite twill? <laughs> oh, okay. I see what you did there. And our favorite twill is our embroidery nerd uh, twill that we have, which you can find on our website. 
Jeff is probably frantically typing in the link into the, the chat. Uh, and it'll probably be the wrong URL, but uh, we'll, we'll correct that later. Uh, uh, I'm... So much confidence in my typing skills. Yeah, I know. I mean, there's only one of us that's spelled embroidered wrong in your company name. So that's... You know what's funny? My logo is still spelled wrong. And even though someone else fixed it for you. Um, but yeah, so this is all I use. There's no um, fancy like um, buckram or there's not like the plastic stuff. Like I have it, um, but not within reach. So yeah. wait, no coffee filters? Nope. Or toilet uh, seat covers? No toilet seat covers. No, nope, this is strictly uh, going to be producing patches uh, that you'll have to cut the edges. Uh, you're going to have to get close to the border. Um, I do have a sample that's worthwhile showing if I, I can how, find it. I love how it looks like he only has one hand. Yeah. And because Jeff said that, I'll use my left hand now. So this is one of the patches I just did. Wow, look, it's my name. Um it and is. Border should look familiar. Yep. Uh, so that's not marrowed, obviously, because it's not a finished patch, but that's Jeff's uh, border design that he has. Um, and it makes it look like a real patch, and then you got to cut along the edge, which is not too difficult. Plus, it's a little bit thicker. This is just a regular satin. You can see the difference in uh, appearance there. It looks a lot better. Uh, and it saves me having to, you know, rethread the marrow for doing literally one patch. Um, totally and, not blurry. Yeah. Well, it's not blurry here. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So bring our faces that far from the, the embroidery needle and we'll watch it. Oh, wait, that's better. Okay. So that's what I'm doing there. Um, I don't know what time we're at, but we should probably get going because I... We're at 7.15. Take... 20 minutes to run this design according to simple math um so i just i don't even have any mighty hoops or anything so that's another 100 something bucks i can save by not having one of them i just complain about it you know monthly about not having one that's it slap her in stick my finger under the needle it's do centered. i need to send you some hoops Wait. i mean i do like hoops do you, do you stick your finger under the needle and then hit start? Is that where we're headed with this? Uh, well, you do need to join the needle prick club. <laughs> I am in that club. Or you go to trade shows and you meet Ramona and you get one of these lovely little bags that have a, a, a no prick stick in it. And you could do that. But I like to live on the edge. So I'll put that on my table, which means it'll be lost forever. Uh, USB key uh, with my um, file. Design. I don't know if you guys really need to see me loading it, but you know what? Why not? Boom, boom, boom. All the sound effects. Well, I feel like I'm playing an Atari with all the noises on this thing. Well, if you get to the right spot, you'll level up. There we go. Level up. All right. So it already has all my colors put in. I need to verify that, even though I know they are right, because I hopefully did it right. And if not, it'll be wrong. But we'll laugh about my failures later. Um, then, then we'll get a second sample. We won't wait till later. <laughs> that is a good point. <laughs> all right. So here we go. I'm going to start this, and then... Um, I don't know how much I'll be able to hear, but that's fine. Okay. And I do not trace because tracing is something that you should do. And not to steal someone else's. This is not an evil laboratory or embroidery laboratory. This is just a dangerous embroidery room. So we're going to go with it. The mildly explosive oh. embroidery club. <laughs> The one thing I've always found really interesting is Matt doesn't typically use underlay on his patches. And I've found that very interesting. They always come out well, but. 
Well, you know, he's he is stitching onto a really kind of a stable material, but I'm kind of with you, Jeff. I'd probably add a little bit. Maybe it would be really light just to make sure it knocks and locks the fabric down to the stabilizer, but his patches come out good, so you can't really say much about it. I mean, I could. We could have a whole conversation. <laughs> well, one thing for sure, and then we should point this out, it's a good idea to do a design trace. Don't always do as Matt does, because <laughs> you don't want to hit a hoop. I'm sorry, but you don't want to do that. Yeah. Are we, no. are we talking our... about how I screwed that up? No, we're talking about how you always trace and don't want to hit a hoop. Oh, yeah. So, fun fact, that hoop, if you look on the end, and I apologize if I'm yelling, I'm wearing a headset. I can't hear my voice. Uh, but there is definitely not a needle penetration right in the side of the hoop because when I did a name patch, allegedly, I forgot to allegedly tell it to start in the center of the design, not in the bottom left corner. So it, you know, thought that this, the, the green part of the hoop was, you know, the center of the design. But that's all alleged. So right. There's totally no proof like that. big. No, there's, no, there's not. Yeah, and no. that, that would give you no reason to just always trace or anything like that, right? That would be a a, a very uh, you know uh, yeah. <laughs> what, um, what stitch length do you use on your fill patterns on your patches? Uh, so this one, the uh, um. Let's see if I can bring it back up. So the the brown background is actually just your standard length. It's like four millimeters or something like that. And then the olive drab, uh, because it has a lot of text on it, I actually just switched to be uh, using like a three millimeter length. And I actually get a much better look out of it. Just yeah, a no, simple it, adjustment like that. And that's uh, that's kind of the reason I brought it up. like because that longer stitch length is going to lay really nice and flat and look really good. But if you're doing stitches on top of it, like lettering, it's going to pull more when you do the lettering. So it's just always a good idea to use a shorter stitch length for those other sections where your lettering is going to go. There he He's is. Back. He's back. Oh, wait, this one. Nope. Oh, and I lost a bobbin. I knew I was going to lose it. And I like thought of it before. Like, you know, it would be a good idea to change the bobbin before you do this. But uh, he lost also that bobbin. gives us another point to talk I about. You said so. that you were an Eagle Scout. <laughs> I didn't ever say that. Okay, good. So let me grab some comments here. Um Simon says, I have my multi-needle a week, so I trace about 10 times before starting. You know, it never hurts to trace. It, it's, I, what do you, what would you say? A reciprocator is about $300 maybe. You know, it's a $300 mistake, and you'll either be replacing it yourself or you'll be paying a lot more to have a technician come out and do it. Um, Frank says, sorry, you guys, 120 a.m. here. Catch the replay on YouTube. We'll talk to you later, Frank. Uh, Brandy says, I did that once. I, I'm not going to um, say that maybe I have hit a hoop before, and it can be a very scary thing. Uh, Terry says it's kind of mesmerizing to watch. I thought that at the vendor shows, too. It It is fun to watch machines run a design, especially if you're not the one that digitized it, because um, you get to kind of see how they did it, and it's really interesting to watch um, how different digitizers will path things differently. And Simon says the no underlay thing is really interesting, though, especially with how dense most patches are compared to on clothing. It makes sense. You know, I always use underlay. And if he sent me that file, I put underlay in it. Yeah. Um, just for the sheer sake of I use underlay on just about everything. I know occasionally there are times where you can get away without it, but I'm just a big firm believer in 
um, using it. And if I wasn't, I would at least spray adhesive the fabric down to the stabilizer because you really want those two to be tacked down together really well. Yeah. Yeah, so that's one of the trade-offs that I have to take into account. So when I'm using my stash frame, I have to make sure that it's taut and that there's not any uh, ripples. Because, like, you can see right here, there's, a like, a little bubble. There's another one back up there. I'm not sticking my finger by that one because then I will join the club. Um, but with me not doing the underlay on this, yes, I can save, a, like, a thousand stitches at most. But... The real thing about that is that thousand stitches at about 900 stitches per minute, that's an extra minute that I can save in production. And when I'm doing a hundred of them, that's a hundred minutes. And that's over an hour worth of just stitching. And it's only if you don't need it. It's not like I'm just trying to cut time for this base layer because I'm putting it onto like a Velcro backing. I don't have to worry about it as much if I'm doing it where someone's going to like um, iron it on with like a heat press material or iron on material like that, then I will definitely leave the underlay in it just so it has that, that extra strength. Um, I didn't talk about the bobbins either. A lot of people like the magnet glides and I just had the black thread break, which is fine. Um, but I'm actually, I switched to Filtex, uh, just paper sided L size bobbins. Uh, just for the sheer cost, it's half as much compared to what, you know, the magnet ones are. So the next comment on my list is, so a good time to ask, how do you back up a Tajima when the bobbin runs out? Uh, hold the red button. Pretty yeah. much on every machine that I'm aware of, you just hold the stop button. And fun fact, um, I can demonstrate this. I mean, so I'm doing it now. And it's going backwards, and then I stop it again. Most machines that I'm guessing, this is not scientifically backed, but if you hold the start button, um, well, okay, so that I went too far back. Okay, ignore that part. It's going to stay at a very slow pace. So right now it's running at 180. And it'll do this for as long as I have my finger on here. And as soon as I let go, it'll ramp back up. If I do it again, it does nothing. My happy bit will slow back down. Yeah, that's different because my machine does not do that. Mine doesn't either. Okay, right, well then, by most machines, I mean my Reforma that I have, my two happies, and this machine. So that's four of four machines that I have. Oh, and the butterfly did that too. So, um, but the bobbins, if you saw me pull this one out, this is the first bobbin out of, I think, seven of these boxes that I've used that has been bad. So that's pretty good trade in my book. You know, Matt, if you charge like 20 cents more, you can use like the Magnet Glide bobbins and not worry about the cost difference. Uh, or I just don't like the Magnet Glides anymore. There was like a problem with manufacturing where they had a whole batch that yeah. had like glue in the middle of the bobbin. Mm -hmm. It, so it made me, it was a nightmare because that's all I had. Um, like I have, uh, I'm just going to tilt this up. There's a, that cabinet thinger up there, that storage bin, that was all full of bobbins and all of them were bad to the point where I just threw them out. Uh, I'd have them in the happy, I'd be running four heads at once. And every like minute I'd have to go just throw a whole bobbin away because it was bad and I it's just one of them. That's the only thing I don't like about the Filtex stuff, but I use the rest of the thread for everything. I know it was probably just a bad batch. It's been over a year. It's probably all corrected, but... He's bob and shy. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's also that my prices have been adjusted to using something half the price that works just as well. The downside with these is that it is slightly more linty on the bottom side but a quick burst of a uh, um you know good old compressed air or canned air really just do it like every four bobbins the quick spray and it's good all right 
Let's catch back up on the comments. So we have Nikki from the Sassy Silver. Ask me what I forgot to put under my patches. I have a feeling it's Twill. <laughs> she says, hi, DJ. <laughs> um, <laughs> recently learned that my Baradim will slow if you continue to hold down the start button as well. And my Avance backs up easily if the bobbin runs out or a periodical thread break. So I know on the ZSK, it's got an actual button that you hold down that's different than the start button to back it up. Um, and the happy has a separate button for it too. Yeah, mine's got a, a stop, go, and a forward button as well. So the forward will just move it ahead without going. Uh, if you hold start, if you hold it, it'll go and actually sew. And if you hold stop, it'll go backwards without sewing because that would be weird. It's not like a van on Malcolm in the Middle where you just drive backwards and the odometer goes backwards so your parents never know that you drove the car. Yeah, that don't work for this. We can't roll back the odometer on your machine. No. Does your machine even keep track of the stitch count? It like does. The running stitch count on it? Yep. Because I know my Happy does, but when you update the um, the firmware on it, it resets that counter. It's a well-known thing. And if you didn't know, I'm telling you. Uh, oh. so the Happies that I have, they're, you can go in the menu, you can see that too. Usually the number is like... Uh, like um, 1.8 million stitches and I go to take a picture of it and I uh, accidentally clear it every time I mean to take a picture of it. So it, I just have to wait another couple days and then I'll be back up at it and then I clear it again and I forget. But uh, yeah. You push the roll back the odometer button. Yeah. Uh, so right now it's doing the top rocker. So this is what uh, I think DJ asked the stitch length. This one, it's adjusted to be um, a point, or not a point, a three millimeter stitch length. Because the more penetrations I can get, the the better the text just lays on it. And the, actually just the better, like the flat appearance of it looks, allegedly. Yeah, well, it's kind of one of those things where the longer the stitch length, like if that was longer, as the satin stitches go in the opposite direction, it's pulling those fills which yeah. is exposing whatever is underneath. So, you know, that's why so many people do the shorter stitch length whenever they have text going over the top of the fill or a lot of other stitches, satin stitches. That's where you can um, hide it with underlay. Yes, Magic. you can. Trying to find a patch that I can show that I have longer. That he can show. I love that part. What? Well, I, I just mean that actually a, a, a good, bad example. That's what I mean. That one I just made. I think you're just going to have to start putting in a box. Bad examples, good examples. Well, I threw that away because I got sick of having it. Well, he got um, so good at doing it, he just doesn't have any bad examples anymore. That's oh, what doing, right? that's what we're going to do. Inflate my ego even more. <laughs> I think this one might work. Um, but I will go to the good camera. The good camera. Um, okay, well, I don't have the macro lens on, but if you look at like the force, the word force, it got a little distorted because my stitch length I believe it's five millimeters mm -hmm. and it just doesn't look as good because I was trying to go for the certain texture that they have in the background of the, the patch that is kind of mocked, but I wasn't too excited with it. Uh, this text is literally supposed to look that bad. It's to make a joke of it. So don't think that it was just me doing a bad job. I mean, it is, but it's a bad job on purpose. Yeah, it's supposed to look like that. I did a great job at doing a bad job, but like school, that that's bad. So this is a, we're going to go with it's a bad patch. Uh, do we have any other questions? We have a comment. Mark says, I've never tried this. Might have to start implementing on the rockers for the text. 
I think it's a, a good, good outcome. Um, I, the edges are just cleaner on the test. Yeah. Like it looks a lot choppier if you do it on like a four millimeter stitch length. That's only because the stitches are like kind of falling into the fill. So that's when you really notice where it's thicker in some areas for a letter and thinner in others. It's, it's that it's anytime it's going the same direction, the satin is the fill it's falling into the fill. So that a little bit shorter of a stitch length helps to clean it up. And not okay. so different. Putting the macro on. Oh, we're going to be blind here in a second. That's what Matt's Tajima looks like with no lens. All right. So, two examples. You know, I should probably find the actual example. That's not it. What did I do with this? So, Simon says this is shorter stitch length on the fill. And, yeah, that's uh, where the, the fill that's sewing now underneath the text is going to have a shorter stitch length than the brown fill. Spice. Spice brown? Did I get it right? Is it spice brown? That's the text? No, the middle fill. Oh, yeah, that's spice brown. I'm learning my colors. All right, I got to cut off. Well, I guess you can see me doing it. I forgot about that. All right. That's painful to watch. Yeah, I'm sorry. We'll just edit this out in post-production. <laughs> okay, cool. So this, once I tell it to focus, I need my readers. So you can see that the, so this is a Greek Parthenon in the background. And uh, I'm supposed to be duplicating the existing design. So if I can get it to zoom in, you can see how messy that fill looks. It just does not look right. So this is two factors. The angle is too steep. And the other bigger one was actually that I was using a four millimeter um, stitch length. And I apologize, it's blurry. I'm trying to hold it at still. Um, however, when I did a simple adjustment, um, you can maybe see that it just, it, it looks a little blurry by a lot, but it, it looks a little bit clearer. I don't know if you agree with me, I know it's a little nauseating probably, but. Yeah, definitely. The edges, even the edges of that fill just look a lot better. And the lettering obviously is much better. And that it's the same exact design. I didn't change anything else. It's the same shape. All I did was change the angle a little bit. And then the, the stitch length, that was it. Again, now my uh, stitch count goes up. Um, does that mean I have to charge a customer the extra dollar in stitches? No, but will I? No, because I'll charge them five extra dollars. Ha 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 ha. Inflation, Evil, right? Fake laugh. Yeah. Actually, right, this lens so kind of works. Barb has a question. Do you have a favorite weight slash fiber content felt for doing felt patches? I have never done a felt patch before. No, I've used um, scrim felt, which is extremely stable. Um, but I've not really used that many other types of felt because I have never had a request for a felt patch. Yeah, and while we're talking about Jeff's order, I want to show this. My order? File right here. Yeah, we're talking about your border. That's oh. what we're talking about, right? Uh, oh, one really okay. nice thing about it is that you can do, I mean, obviously you can do it with the embroidery, but I have a satin underneath it to give it a, the, the patch border a little extra pop. Instead of just doing black with purple, now there's two purples, which includes the company logo colors and just makes it look a lot cooler. So all their patches have that in it just looks super cool. I mean, of course, I'm going to say that because I made it. But, uh, <laughs> it does it look is. good. Good job, it. Matt. Uh, thank you. I'm patting my back for you. You just can't. No, well, I guess maybe. No, you can't. 
All right. So Nikki says that the text looks cleaner with the shorter stitch length. Uh, Simon, I literally have a patch design open and I'm changing the stitch length to three millimeters right now. Uh, Brandy says, thanks for the tip about the shorter stitch length. And I love his borders. Thank you. It's the one, one thing I will say is that your design and your mileage may vary with the stitch length. Like not everyone you're going to want to do that, but it's, it's yeah. worth a shot. A few extra stitches might, you know, drastically or significantly improve the quality. Drastically is like either bad or dinosaurs, depending on how to spell it. No, and it's it's finding the right time to do it because like your fill, the original fill, even though there's satins on top of it, there's enough area that you can get away with it. Um, and it still looks nice and clean. It's just that text is so important to come out looking sharp. Because if the text doesn't come out looking sharp on a patch, it kind of fails. And yeah. that's kind of with every logo, though, too. Everybody, yeah. you know, lettering you can fudge a lot of things, but lettering, everybody can recognize lettering. They all know what it's supposed to look like if a W doesn't change. Oh, one more thing. I, I just realized when I found the old example I was actually looking for. The bottom patch, this is the same as the, the one that I showed you. However, it's a uh, a regular density. It's the 0.4, it's even like a 0.36 or 0.38. So it's like super thick. It looks really weird. And again, this one, this one's actually a 0.5. So this, this, the Parthenon background, in complete summary, it's a three millimeter stitch length, a 0.5 density, and I think it's your standard underlay, it's like the zigzag. Oh, and I moved the uh, the edge run in to like 1.2 or 1.5 or something. It's it just kind of helps it from you know being exposed with the harsh angle. It's a it's a significant difference in quality between just by reducing the amount of uh, actual thread density that you have there. Mm -hmm. And, and we're almost asked, done. do you use 7511 sharps for uh, everything on your patches? I use whatever I have. It is, let me find it. It'll go through your uh, finger. It's that yeah. sharp. So there is a post that Louise Vitor did where he showed like all different kinds and i bought a bunch i have a whole shelf over there of 65 9 70 10 this is 75 11s and then 80 12s what i use is probably going to be too blurry but it's these guys here and i'll just read it to you they are regulars rgs so DBXK5, RG, whatever that means. What, um, Jeff, what do you usually, I mean, for the majority of your embroidery, what are you using? Um, I typically use a 7010. Uh, what, unless if, what, I, I found that if I use a 7010 on hats, um, I'll get more thread breaks and like the Caterpillar thing going on. So when I do a hat, I'll swap them out to 7511s, and then when they need to be replaced again, I'll put 7010s in. Good deal. What do you sharp or ballpoint mostly? Um, for the most part, I use uh, sharps. If I'm doing something really open, like a t-shirt or a sweater, or something that it's like the you notice it with like the center of O's and E's where it'll actually cut a hole in the garment. That's yeah. those are the fabrics that I typically. Yeah, I mean knits, especially like a ballpoint, is a works a lot better. You won't cut the fibers as much. Uh, so if you missed that, I can save a couple seconds of runtime by having the connectors. Um, the way that I used to do it is, uh, what Jeff called anchoring when I first was running patches where you have it go, uh, you like actually plot a, a stitch manually where you have it set to like 10 millimeter stitch length. You go off and then come back in. Um, 
I stop doing that unless if it's going to be covered up by the next part. Um, I just disable trim and then it'll go to the next part and then I'll do that. And then if you actually go back and you play this through again, you'll see that it did world jumped to famous. It came down here, ran down, did the 34 AMU jumped across uh, from the U then it went up to here, did this came back around, did that. And then went into the border. So from the text, the border and this inside black, there was no trims. And that can save, because I'm doing this production wise, I'm not doing this as a hobby where I can use a single needle machine and rethread it a couple times. I need speed where I can just set the machine up. So I do little tricks like that. Um, plus, uh, you can, if you do it, I have a patch right here. So this patch uh, between the, the little talons here, there's that you can actually maybe see that there's a yellow line running right here and it also runs up that way. That's exactly what I'm talking about, how I used to do it. Um, but I, cutting it was a pain because then you got to get under it here and yeah, I mean, I'm going to struggle now because I'm on camera, but then you have to pick that out and then you have to cut it there versus now I just disable trim, snip, snip, done. And you can save a lot of time that way. Um, but if you have trimming everywhere, you're going to get it. It's going to get really thick. Like, obviously, you can't feel how thick this is, but you can maybe see that tail in there because it trims twice in that area. It's it's a little thick. So. I try to use jump stitches as much as I can. I know a lot of people don't like them, but. Well, it comes down to the production time. Yeah. Would you rather snip them out with scissors or have your machine trim them? And what's the trade off? Yeah. And there, there's a patch design that I did make where I had, uh, I think around 17 snips that I had to do. Uh, once I did that, I swore I would never do that again because the amount of time I, as one person doing start to finish patches, that did not save me any time. It actually took a lot more. But this is the patch. Um, there's a little bit of white bobbin coming through where I think the bobbin ran out. Um, but other than that, I think it looks pretty good. Uh, so how do we finish it up? Good thing Jeff asked that question. Wait, Matt, how do we finish it up? OK, well, thanks for asking. <laughs> <laughs> I am going to grab some supplies, which I guess you can see me doing that again. I forget that I added that uh, camera. I don't know where the other scissors is. That's fine. Jeff is probably like me looking at it. I'd get that heat craft tool out and start burning the edge off. All right. I'm going to switch the lens. Don't go into the light. Now, I don't know where I put the other lens. Oh, it's over here. <laughs> By the way, if you think embroidery is expensive, try camera gear. <laughs> yeah, that is very expensive too. And a lot easier to break. Yeah. Okay. Let's see. So a few things. Scissors. That's really all you need to cut it out. Uh, granted, if you are uh, less gifted in the vision department, it might be a little bit harder. Uh, but depending on what materials you use. Um, so if you have a hard time cutting close to the edges and you keep fraying it, one of the tricks that you can do is use a different stabilizer, which I have a sample of it, which is in my drawer, which if I was smart, I would have grabbed it. Um, but I'm, you know, everyone's a little challenged. Uh, this is a sample that Jeff gave me, which he can tell you what it actually is. It's, um, it depends on what you, what company you buy it from. Madeira, it's Weblon, Ganold, it's Soft and Shear. I forget what Floriani calls it. DJ will know. No show nylon mesh or power mesh. Yep. So, yeah, so it's either nylon or polyester, depending on the company that's making it. So this is really nice because if you use this with our twill, you can just, it'll just like evaporate away with a little bit of heat. This cutaway is a lot more rigid, which allows me to do the, the no underlay, which is another reason why I like it. Um, 
another key thing that you don't think of until it's too late after you do 200 patches. If you're doing a border like this, where this is your finished border, you want both top and bottom materials to be as close to the same material or color as possible. So if I did white, when I cut this, you're going to see white. Or if your bobbin tensions are off, you're going to see white uh, a lot too. But you will see the stabilizer. But because it's black, it's black border, it'll be fine. So first thing I do is cut it out relatively close because why not do more steps? And, and then more in the middle of the camera. Yep. There we go. And then I'm just going to come through and I'm going to cut as close as I can to it. Um, and it's just gliding it. I keep it towards the very back of the scissors here. And then I just kind of run it around. Bring it off. This is the part that always sucks, which is why rocker patches suck. But, you know, you get money. And uh, right there, if you, you might not be able to see it, I did nick it. There's a tiny little hair right there, which and is by fine. Hair, he means thread. That is. You can always like awesome. kind of go around the edge with like fray block or something before you cut and not have to worry about that. Oh, I learned the funnest thing. Fray check is flammable. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> we won't go into how we discovered that little fun fact. Yeah, so th that's where, like, the fray block is different. Oh, is it? Yeah. Okay. So it, it won't, because one will even change the color of threads and stuff, um, like the fray check. The fray block, you can use, like, your craft tool with it okay All right. not an open flame though so if you couldn't tell i got a little quiet which meant i was focusing um i did nick it a couple times but that's also because i'm doing this like two feet away from my face so i can't actually really see where i'm at um because these scissors are uh you know right-handed scissors i'll go with that this inside corner is always really tough to get um, there is a pair of scissors that I have somewhere in here, but I don't know where it is. So, yay. Um, but it's just getting it as close as you can to it, not focusing a whole lot of time because this dental torch. So wait, we have a question here. Uh, it's awesome. Barb asks, have you ever used a heavy water soluble stabilizer like Badge Master instead so you don't trim patches? I have used it for, I think, exactly one patch design, and it was <laughs> the first one that I did, which is actually where Jeff and I met. We've talked about that a couple times. Uh, it was the 100 micron. Was, uh, well, well, it's that, not water soluble. Heat away. Yeah, that's the heat away. So I guess, no, that is true. That is heat away. I do have it. I do have the Q102, which was recommended by Eric. Um, but I don't think I ever like used it in production. I've tried using it, um, but I couldn't get it to the speed or the quality that I wanted. Um, so doing the border, a lot of people recommend getting like a big lighter. Uh, if you're doing multiple patches, when you keep setting it down, you got to keep relighting it. It gets hot and you burn your finger. That sucks. So you just get one of these guys, and as long as there's alcohol in it, oh, it was lit. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say. It's oh, there's okay. fire there. We don't need our well, fingerprints. I guess you can see it in the camera. But um, basically, <laughs> as I zoom in, uh, last time we had an open flame in my room in a live, we uh, had to get the fire extinguisher. Um, but basically, just take the patch, run it along the edge. And that'll kind of uh, shrink it in a little bit. There's going to be a couple spots where I, I nicked it. Uh, you can kind of maybe see, if I touch the screen, you can see right there, right in front of my finger, there is a little hair. All I need to do is simply get a little heat on it, and I just kind of tap it back. This one, I didn't do a very good job at it. But again, when you're not trying to do this live with an audience, it's not as bad. But it's um, easier when you're not on camera. Yeah. And like this part, I just rock it back and forth. 
take my finger, run it along. Now that's done. After a while, your finger doesn't feel anything anymore. I don't blow on it. If it does catch a little flame, just shake it. And that part's done. And then again, right here. You definitely develop a feel for it. That's for sure. Yeah. And that's that. And cap that off. Oh, by the way, this was, I think, $10 on Amazon. And then you can buy a gallon of denatured alcohol or denatured fuel. It's one of those words at any like home improvement store or whatever come in a giant metal can, well, I guess a gallon metal can. Um, and if you don't have a funnel, it's really fun because you pour it everywhere and it's super flammable. And then you're worried about your garage burning down. Uh, so you pour water everywhere, but then you realize it just spreads it everywhere. And now you sit there, you know, uh, I digress. Uh, but yeah, it saves a lot of time because all you gotta do is one flick and then you're done. Um, but if you're just doing like one patch, then yeah, a big lighter is fine. But I don't do one patch. So that's our patch. You can see um, that's that. Pretty simple. Now from here, you could go, you could put heat seal on the back. You could put iron on them, however you want to do it. Um, and so how actually, are we going to do it, Matt? I'm actually going to take, I'm going to retract what I just said. Because I always think of, Oh, I need to put iron on backing and I just cut out my patch. Well, now that means I got to heat press iron on backing onto it and then I have to cut it again. So if you're smart, before you cut your patch out, you would put iron on backing. So you only have to cut it once. Um, I have totally not done it the other way before where I'm now cutting out iron on backing on 150 patches that I already cut out. And that is a lot of fun. But yeah, so again, lessons learned. There's no trade secrets here. It's just Enderly is an idiot, and uh, you can do better. So, uh, I think it's called learn from my mistakes, so you don't have to make them. Uh, so I do agree. So the next thing that we have is Velcro is how I normally do it. I don't really want to go too into detail with it because there's a ton of different ways that we can do this. But if you look at the other camera, the little me, I have a, a ton of like Velcro blanks that I just cut out on my laser. I just feed it right through. You can see the big roll right here. It goes into laser and I just sit there. I literally have this awesome like laboratory stool. Uh, and I just sit there and I just click, slide, click, slide, click. And that's all I do. And then I can put them on the patches and I just get these. Oh, hey, I found my scissors I was looking for. And then you just get the little circles and there you go. Um, as I digress a lot, these are my favorite scissors ever because they are spring loaded and they are super pointy and super sharp. If you drop them on your feet, they will go through your shoes. Um, but they work really good to get into that tight corner um, of like this patch right here. So you can get in there really well. Um, but Velcro, you have so many different options. You can use genuine Velcro, which is a lot more expensive. You can get it with the adhesive back. Then there's two different kinds. There's rubber adhesive, and then there's vinyl adhesive. Um, one of them is really toxic when you laser cut it. Uh, that just happens to be the one that I bought. So I do not recommend it. You're... Your venting is not adequate, no matter how much you think you have. Um, but it is pretty strong. Um, but my process is, I will take, I mean, I guess I do have a patch. So I also laser cut my patches too, if I'm putting a marrow border on, which that's a whole separate live. That's this red guy right there. That's next week. Yeah, I don't know if it'll be next week. Um, <laughs> but... Uh, so these are all my patches that I got to put mirror borders on yet in the Velcro. So luckily with that uh, red machine, I can do both at the same time. So you take the, the patch, the Velcro, slap it on there, and it's magic. You just stick it on the machine and push the foot pedal, and then it'll spin it around and put the border on. And then you get this. Um, and what I do in between these, because it's... It's, there's no adhesive. Also, if you don't put adhesive on it, um, 
this is also applicable for, I know you can't see my face, but that's probably a good thing. Um, the, if you have like an actual border patch that um, like, uh, like this one here, this one is a satin border. It's already like done. You could put the heat seal on the back. You could press it onto a polo, whatever you want. If you're putting it on Velcro and then you just sew it, uh, pre pretending that, you know, it's the same shape. Um, if you take it, it'll flex and it'll have a little pop in the middle. I don't like that. So what I do is I have a, uh, obsession with 3M Super 77 and my lovely uh -huh. Chipotle box that my wife got from the hospital when they catered Chipotle. You can see just how much of it is in there. It looks like a winter wonderland on camera, uh, but it's at least half an inch thick of highly flammable stuff. Um, but I just lay all the Velcro out and spray it with that real quick, stick the patch on it, put it in the heat press with it off, and I just clamp it. And while I'm while it's clamping, then I'm getting the next batch all put together after about like five minutes of it being clamped it is solid it is not coming off it will not pop and then i can put the border on or i can sew it together and it's perfect and that's an extra nice security because then as you're sewing the border it doesn't shift and then you don't screw up a patch but and speaking of screwing up a patch if you screw up a patch you didn't screw up a garment that's not a 20 dollar, 80 dollar shirt or a you know another richardson that you have to rehoop so I think that's another benefit. So where are we at? Uh, 56 minutes. So I think minute, that's pretty good timing. Minute. Yep. So what else do we got? Matt, we have Matt on the big camera. Um, Nikki says that she's working on a block age patch and she has found that the X-Acto knife works so much better than the scissors. Um, there are some patches that are that way. Uh, and this story time was brought to you by Patch Rave. And we have Mark saying thank you. We have a thumbs up from Randy. And Barb says keep the fire lamp away from the box. <laughs> and now we can't hear Matt. Yep, he's muted. He muted himself. You're muted, Matt. Oh, it's because I got rid of the other stream. The wrong camera. Well, I guess um, unless you guys have anything else to add, we can go ahead and close it out. Um, I don't no. think I have anything. All right. Well, I'm Jeff Fuller from Fuller Embroidery Works. That is the patch from Matthew at Patch Race. That's Matthew Enderly from Patch Race. And we have DJ Anderson from Digitizing Masterclass. We're all here representing the Embroidered Nerd, and we will catch you guys later. See you guys.